What up dudes and dudettes? Back at it again. Gonna be installing these pocket fender flares. Seems to be a lot of mystery surrounding these things, so hopefully this video will answer a lot of questions. Let's get straight to it. <laughs> All right, guys, before we start the installation portion of the video, I just wanted to go over where I purchased these fender flares from, how much they were, their general size specification, and also the mounting hardware that I purchased. That way, if at the end of the video, you guys decide you like the look and you wanna do it yourself, you can replicate it. These are the exact fenders that I purchased, about 33 bucks shipped. And here's the exact hardware that I bought. Also, just a little hint, when you're on eBay, there will be upsellers that try to use specificity to sell higher volumes of products, or they try to sell it for a higher price. In this case, they're selling stuff for a higher price by showing pictures of D21s, and that gets people to think that those are the ones that they need to buy for their truck when really they're just cheap $30 fenders. So keep that in mind. First things first, we're gonna pre-drill the fender flare. I just used one of the washers from the hardware kit, lined it up dead center, marked it with my marker, drilled it out with a 15 64ths bit. Then I came over to my little conical deburr tool. You don't need this, you can just use a larger drill bit. And I used that to clean up the surface so it's nice and flat and I don't have any fitment issues because of it. Reason that I like to pre-drill before I put it on the truck is it makes things a lot easier, especially when you get everything lined up with the tape exactly how you want it. You don't have to worry about it shimming around when you hit it with the drill. Your holes will already be there. You can mark them, take the fender off, center punch, drill the holes as you need. This next part is really important, something you don't wanna mess up on, but I'm gonna leave it at your discretion. You might be running different wheels, you might be running different ride heights, all that stuff matters. I determined that this is the best location for the fenders. I like it right above this body line on both the front fender and the rear. And you might notice that there's a lot less material here than right there. There's a reason for that. This is about 100 millimeters from the center of here down to the bottom of this. On the front, this is about 70 millimeters. So there's a 30 millimeter difference between the bedside and the front fender. So don't let that throw you off. Also, another thing to consider is the distance back here on this bedside is different than the front fender. Just to give you a visual representation. So you end up putting the fenders something like this. That in theory looks really cool. I personally don't like it sitting that low. It kind of throws the truck off. But if you try to do that same thing on the front, you'll see what I mean in just a second. So if, if you can see right away, you open up this section right here because this is physically wider at that point than it is here. So anyway, food for thought.
I almost forgot to mention what I'm using to drill the holes for the rib nuts. So the outer casing of this rib nut is about seven millimeters. So I start with an eighth inch pilot bit, drill my hole, and then I come over here with the stepper bit, go up to the 930 seconds mark, because that's about 7.3 millimeters, so it's close enough. That's the closest I have. I don't have metric drill bits. So just wanted to cover that before I forgot. If you just take your time with the initial fit up, you'll end up with something like this. No gaps, no weird warping issues, just a nice clean fender install. All right, now I'm gonna work on the rears. Sweet, I got the fender flare mounted exactly where I want it. So I'm gonna go ahead and mark and drill the holes. I know it looks a little bit like a monster truck right now. Fear not, this thing's getting lowered quite a bit. I'm also gonna be spacing the wheels out so they fit a lot better underneath the fenders. Now that the riv nuts are installed, I can come in and cut out this piece of metal for wheel clearance. But more importantly, check out my cool little scissors. <laughs> so I got to this point right here by using an angle grinder with a cutoff wheel. As you can see, nice clean line all the way around. And this is the outer material right here, folded out with some needle nose pliers. And you can see there's an inner skin. This, if you've ever done like an S chassis uh, over fender install, you'll understand exactly what you gotta do at this point. So typically what you do is you cut off this lower piece right here. You make nice little pie cuts all the way across, fold this piece up, take your welder, weld all the way around. However, on these trucks, it's a little bit different. First and foremost, this material is a lot thicker than the gauge that's used on the outside of the 240. Also, you have this body line. I don't know what the technical term for this is because it's not called a body line, it's called something else. But anyways, you have this running right through here. So you have a lot of support uh, versus like the quarter on a 240 where it's just a little floppy and stuff. So um, the big thing with 240s and why people do that is because when you have water sheeted up underneath, what it'll do is it'll fling the water into the back of the quarter. Since unlike a 240, you can see these are just open to the world. There's nothing there. There's no pocket back here. But on a 240, it's a unibody car. It's all connected. So it'll fling water into it. It pools in the back side or even the front side and then it'll rust out from the inside. So a lot of people like to just weld that all up, put a sealer on it, and then um, undercoat it. But for these trucks, a little bit different. You don't have to do that. If you don't have a welder, fear not. So what you'll do is just take, trim around here somewhere, kind of fold this piece up close to this uh, upper outer sheet. And then you can take some spray foam, spray it in there, because you'll want to make sure that the metal's primered. So any of the cut edges, you kind of primer those shoot some spray foam inside of there, then use like an undercoater and put a rubberized undercoating over it just to kind of seal it all up and make sure that no water from the tire will just fling up. Because remember back here, there's no real place for the water to go. I mean, it can get kind of caught up in that wheel well up there, but it would have to travel pretty far and up. It's got to fight gravity, everything else to get there. And if you did a good job sealing with the foam and the undercoater, it won't even penetrate. So anyways, I just wanted to throw that little piece of advice in there for you. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and put my money where my mouth is and uh, do it the way I suggested before. So as you can see, you got a nice clean cut up here, all the way around. I shot some self-etching primer on those edges, that way it can adhere to that bare metal really well. As you can see back here, you can see how it opens up. So it's not real critical that you need to put foam up here, you need to seal it all up, because water has somewhere to go, but I'm gonna do it anyways, because I don't want it splashing up deep into the wheel well. So anyway, I'm gonna get the other side done just like this. I'm gonna go grab some foam and then grab some undercoating. Step two of the sealing process is complete. As you can see, the foam has a nice tight bond to both sides and the gap is filled quite nicely. It's about 80 degrees outside and relatively humid. That's actually how this stuff cures is through humidity. Uh, it took about two hours to get to this point. Then I used an old bread knife and a $3 rasp from Home Depot to shape everything the way I want it. So now I can go under there and undercoat it. And what's neat about this great stuff exterior foam is that once it sets up, it's no longer water permeable. And I'll show you what I mean in a second. Another reason I chose this foam is because it's inability to retain water after it's cured. So you can see when you spray it with water, it doesn't absorb into the foam whatsoever. It just stays on top of it you can sheet it off. See what I mean? So yeah, that's a big bonus. 
Step three is now complete. I really like this stuff. It goes on extremely thick. I did three medium wet coats and here we are. So about to unmask everything while it's still a little wet. That way it gives me nice sharp tape lines, but I have no doubt that it fully sealed that foam up. Very heavy duty stuff, I like it. Definitely using this more in the future. It was cheap too. I know some of you guys are already curious about the fuel door situation, so let me kind of explain a little bit. Uh, I'm not using my fuel door on this truck just because I'm running a fuel cell. However, I still want to do it the right way to where it's still functional because I don't want it to look all weird that this is just fastened straight to the fuel door. I don't like that. So what I did was I marked the outside of the fender flare. I'm going to pop this door back off, go and cut that. I'm actually going to recoat this uh, fuel door since it's like yellow. It's a different color. The painter messed up on this piece right here when matching, so I'm going to redo that. But um, I'm going to cut that piece out. Then I'm going to take an angled piece of steel, like a little L bracket. I'm going to rivet to the inside, basically the inside of where that door is. And then I'm going to riv nut the top of it. That way this has somewhere to fasten to. That way I can remove the fender from the actual truck whenever I need to. And also I can take the door off and the door works properly and everything else. So. Voila. All right, peeps, I think that's gonna pretty much wrap up this video. I'm really happy with how everything turned out. I think the next thing I'm gonna work on is getting this sway bar set up, the steering linkages all connected, and the actual steering link from the steering column itself to the gearbox. Then I'm also going to come back here and put the bed liner coating. So it'll kind of cover these bed rails on the bed sides and this part and also the uh, tailgate, the cap of the tailgate in the back of it. I think that'll look really nice. I did lower the truck down a little bit. I think this is about as far as I'm gonna lower it until I actually get the fuel cell, tailgate, everything on the truck the way I want it and fill it up with fuel just to see kind of where the truck sits. I went ahead and ordered the 15 millimeter spacers all the way around so that way we can pull these wheels out. I mean, they got about 15 millimeters to go this way and they are gonna be perfect, so. All in all, I think this is a successful endeavor. So I'll catch you guys on the next one. Cheers.